Amen. Every trouble, every trial, every sorrow, every pain that we deal with down here, God's going to make it brand new again. Amen. No more tears, no more hurting. Sister Linda fought a hard battle. She has been uh, unhealthy for quite a long time now. When they first started coming here, she had some medical issues. And um, then, of course, she, for all intents and purposes, just practically died there in the middle of the night in her house had it not been for David who worked so hard doing CPR until the ambulance got there. Um, she would have died then, but David had purpose in his heart. He wasn't ready to let his wife go yet. And God blessed that and God honored that. David passed away a few years after that. Then Sister Lola, Linda's mom, passed away not too long after that. And now Sister Linda. It's just been hard for that family and uh, for us here at Bethel to see these people leave. Uh, but we know they are in a better place, and I'm very, very thankful for that. Jesus is the one who makes all things new. Amen. 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 And I may get into a little bit of that tonight as we move out of John chapter 2 and into John chapter 3. I appreciate you being here. Um, I've just been, I've just been kind of sad this week uh, with Sister Linda's passing. She was such a beautiful woman, godly woman, and be beautiful on the inside. And that's where it's that's where it counts the most. And um, just the blessing that she has been to our church. Um, we had talked one time a while back about how God was going to bring her to the point where she'd be able to come again and give her testimony again. That's what we loved. She probably gave, without a doubt, the best testimony. Uh, I'm not saying nobody else has a testimony, but she just, with all the things that she went through and all the things that she battled, she never complained. Never was bitter at God over anything. She just knew that God had sustained her and God had, had held her up and God was the one that gave her strength. She had very strong faith in the Lord. And um, so pray for um, the family. Pray for us as we prepare. The funeral will not be here. It'll be at Man Funeral Home in DeSoto. Uh, visitation... Festus. Oh, I'd have been going to DeSoto. Well, where's man and Festus? Collins Drive? Okay. That used to be Lemmy Funeral Home. I knew the, yeah. So, well, that would have been bad. I'm glad you said that. I'd have, I was, I was going to go to DeSoto. Friday. But, um, she'll, um, We'll have the service over there, and she's going to be buried next to David at uh, Sandy Baptist Cemetery, which is beautiful, way out in the country cemetery here in Jefferson County. A lot of folks from Bethel, Sister Waymar is over there, Warren, Carolyn Bergman's over there, and uh, just several folk. I think Sister Bernice, is she over there too? Oh, that's right. They took, we took her down to Bernie. That's right. I remember that. But there's several people from Bethel over at that uh, cemetery there. And um, then we'll be having a dinner here for the family. And so just pray for uh, me as I prepare. Uh, John's going to say a few things. And um, then uh, Sister Jan is going to try to talk. She's going to give her mom's testimony. That's what she's going to do. 
and she's struggling with that. So lift her up and, and uh, pray for her. All right. John chapter 2, verse 18. Uh, we started on this here a little, a little while ago, talking about the temple that Jesus was referring to. What temple was he talking about? John chapter 2, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. Something you remember when you, when you read this is that God really does not dwell in temples made with hands. Now there are some people, haven't got into the prayer yet, but there are some people who believe that the Jews are going to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem. And although they don't know it, they're going to build it. And Jesus is going to come and dwell in it. It's good. They, they keep referring to the rebuilt temple. And, and I guess some people just forget about this. But I do not believe when Jesus comes back that he will dwell in a man-built temple. I believe what the scripture says. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. And Hebrews tells us that the Lord pitches his own tabernacle. He does it himself. He doesn't, he doesn't dwell in the one that mankind builds. Doesn't matter how much money they spend on it. Doesn't matter how high they build it, how ornate they make it, how much gold they use. I don't believe that's the temple that Christ is... And, and I've had people say, what, you believe Jesus, the Jews aren't going to rebuild a temple? I'm saying it doesn't matter. If they do, Jesus will just tear it down or have it tore down again. And he's going to dwell in a temple, a tabernacle that he himself builds. And what is that? Verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered, because he said in three days, I'll do this. His disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. I pray, Father, first of all, that you'd grant uh, great mercy and blessing upon your people tonight. Father, that you'd give them grace. Give us, Father, an ear that will hear your word, a heart, Lord, that is inclined unto your word. And, Father, hands, Lord, that will hold on tight and never let go of these precepts, these commandments, these thy statutes. Father, we will cling to them and they will be part of our lives. They will be part of our heart, part of our thinking. And everything that we believe about what happens in this world, Father, it's either going to come from Scripture or we're just not going to buy it. That's all there is to it. I pray, dear God, that you would work that work in your people's hearts and lives, Father. Many conversations I've had with people who, Father, when I talk to them, I can just tell. They don't, they don't know your word or they don't believe your word or they... They try to add so many things or take away things from your word, Father, and it just... Lord, it just bugs me. But I know, Lord, I have mercy on them people. I have compassion on them. Help me to remember that because I used to be the same way. So, Father, just bless your people and open up your hand and feed us, dear God, from manna from heaven. Help us to believe your word, trust your word, have faith and confidence in everything that it says Nothing added to it, nothing taken away from it. Just bless your word tonight among your people's hearts and bless these that have come. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen. And we had talked about uh, Romans 7, talking about the body of Christ. When he sp speaks of the, his body, naturally he's speaking of the birth body that God gave him there in Bethlehem in the manger when he was born, but also... Referring to the body of the believers of Jesus Christ, which is his church. His church is his body. 
Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 talked about the different members of the body. Even though they're all different members, none of them is more special than the other. There isn't one part of this church that's more necessary and more needed than another part of this church. There are strong parts and there are weak parts. Just like in my body, there's strong parts and there's weak parts. There's good looking parts. You didn't laugh at that, did you? And not so good looking parts. But all the parts, God created them to be equal, to be part of the body. And I need every one of them and would, and would use every one of them. And that's how it is in the church. Doesn't matter how important someone thinks they are or how little someone thinks they are, God still has a purpose for them in his body and in his ministry. Then, let me put this up on the screen. And then we'll go, t turn your Bible to Exodus 26. Uh, huh? Uh, help him out, John. It's the second, it's all the way back toward the beginning. It's after Genesis, Exodus 26. Now, I'll sort of give you a rundown of how I came across this. I had help when uh, several years ago I'd written the two books on Bible numbers and Southwest Radio Church out of Oklahoma City was had published them and they had done some radio programs with me and then they sort of liked what they heard and they invited me to speak at some of their conferences. Well, at one of the conferences, I met a guy, and I just, I love this guy. His name is Dr. Chuck Thurston. Um, he's got a sense of humor like mine. He loves to crack really stupid jokes. And I get all of his jokes. He gets all of mine. But he is an ER physician. ER physicians... Are very, are, te are very bright people and they think quickly. They, they have to. Cause when somebody comes in and it's a matter of minutes before they die, that doctor has to know what it's going to take to try to save their life in just literally a matter of seconds or a matter of minutes. So they're very unique people. And he had just written a book called Aleph Bet Soup. Not alphabet, Aleph Bet. And it was Aleph Bet because those are the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And what he had seen was, he had seen that the human cell, everything that makes up every part of our body, what you see is skin. But under a microscope, you won't see skin you'll see very tiny skin cells that are grouped together, bonded together. And as a doctor, he knew the, the general makeup of the human cell. He knew what kind of human cells they, there were. And he got to thinking about the tabernacle in the wilderness. And he said, well, the cell has a membrane or a wall. Um, that... Uh, Vegetable, I'm thinking of the, the plant kingdom, has cell walls that are harder than the animal kingdom. So there's cell walls in the plant kingdom and cell membranes in the animal kingdom. Animal kingdom, they have to be softer because we bend more than most plants do. But anyway, he started looking at that and he said, well, let's see, the cell membrane is the curtain around the tabernacle. And then he said, the mitochondria is where the food goes into the cell and it's burnt there and it gives off heat and it gives off light, which is energy. And that's what energizes the cell. So he said, that's the altar. And then he said, the sanctuary where the DNA is stored must be the nucleus. And he came up with that and we were talking over dinner one night and he was explaining this to me and I was just, I was blown away. So he gave me a copy of his book and I read it and I'm just loving it. And then when he got to the part about the amino acids of DNA, where DNA 
makes a code, Joe, like Morse code. Morse code is dots and dashes. Well, that's what a D, that's basically what DNA is. It's a series of dots and dashes that make up letters. Usually in, in Morse code, there's like a combination of three, either three lines or three dots. Am I correct in that? Did you learn Morse code in the army? Maybe a little. A little bit. You wouldn't remember it though to say, I remember SOS, dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Well, amazingly, in the genetic code, it takes three base pairs joining together to make one letter, just like it does in Morse code. And does anybody know when Henry um, Morse no, William F.B. Morse, or whatever his name was. The guy who invented Morse code. What was the first Morse code message that he sent? Does anybody know? Give you a free DVD if you can remember it. It was from Scripture. What hath God wrought? First thing that was ever sent by Morse code, and it worked, okay? So that's how DNA works. DNA basically breaks our genetics down into this code of three, three base pairs joined together. That makes one letter. They're called amino acids. Well, Dr. Thurston figured out that there was 22 of those amino acids or 22 letters that make up the genetic code words that make up the members of our body and no that's the number of chromosome pairs I'll get to that in a minute okay but it's 22 amino acid combinations that make the letters that make the words that make the genetic code of our DNA and he tells me that and I knew that number 22 and I said that's a number for revelation and he was fascinated by that so we parted and then we met up again somewhere in Ohio and I had then was running by him the things that I had found since the last time I met him. And he said, wow, he said, you know, the numbers, don't you? And I said, well, I've you got me started on this. So thank you for that. But anyway, here's here's what I'm getting at. God knew this before anybody else did. And I look, did some looking up a man by the name of Robert Hook. Remember, we didn't have microscopes until about three or four hundred years ago. The first rudimentary microscopes were invented and a man by the name of Robert Hooke discovered that our body wasn't just groups of large things put together, that those large things like your liver and your lungs and your heart, they were made of individual pieces called cells. And they, he was able for the first time to look through a microscope and see those individual cells. And he drew them out. And he said, this is what composes the body. Then it wasn't until 1956 that somebody accurately counted the number of human chromosomes, which is, that's what you're thinking of, Bobby is the chromosome pairs that are in our cells is 23. There's 23 pairs making 46 total. So in Exodus 26, verse 18, God said, thou shalt, when he's, he's telling Moses how he wants this, this tabernacle built, this building, where he's going to put the Ark of the Covenant and the Book of the Law which was written in the 22 letters, just like DNA. And he said, thou shalt make the boards for the tabernacle, 20 boards on the south side, southward. And thou shalt make 40 sockets of silver under the 20 boards, two sockets under one board for his two tenons, and two sockets on another board for his two tenons. This was, they were held together by the tenons. And for the second side, they weren't held together by nails because you couldn't nail this thing together. Why? It had to be taken apart every time they moved somewhere. So you couldn't nail them. 
So they used tenons to hold it together. And um, then he said, verse 20, For the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, there shall be 20 boards, and there are 40 sockets of silver, two sockets under one board, the two sockets under another board, and for the sides of the tabernacle westward, thou shalt make six boards. So check that out. 20 boards on the north side, 20 boards on the south side, six across the back. Now, I know some of you have seen this before, but maybe somebody is watching this for the very first time. They've never seen this before. What God did was, was he took the, the law that Moses wrote, the book of the law, all the commandments, and the Ten Commandments that God himself wrote using the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Moses writing out all of the other commandments and how they were to do this and how, the, how they were to make this tabernacle. He's writing all of this down. The instructions for everything. The instructions for the service that they were to hold. The instructions for the Levites on how they were to do this. How they were to sacrifice this animal. How they were to do the Day of Atonement thing and so on. Moses is writing all of this down in the Hebrew language which has 22 letters in it. And he puts that book and rolls it up like a scroll, just like DNA is rolled up like a scroll. And he puts it in the Ark of the Covenant and he puts it in the most holy place, which is in the back there of the tabernacle. And that sanctuary part where the Ark of the Covenant was is the cell nucleus. So in the tabernacle... The rolled up scroll of the law written in 22 letters, just like DNA, was stored in the nucleus of the tabernacle, just like your DNA is stored in the nucleus of your cell. And the information, like I say, we didn't know that we were made of cells until roughly 400, a little bit more than, a little less than 400 years ago. We didn't know that we had 46 chromosomes that were our DNA makeup until 1956. That's 10 years before I was born. Okay? How old were you in 56? Anybody? You weren't? I was in my dad's... Uh... Okay, whatever. All right. So was I. 1956. That's as far back as that goes. We just found that out in 1956. And yet Moses makes 46 boards that's going to house the DNA book of the law. And who told him to do it that way? God did. Because God is the one who didn't need a microscope and he didn't need anything else because he's the one that made it exactly that way. Amen? So the 46 boards contain the book of the law. There's the cell nucleus. There's the mitochondria. That, and that's the altar that burns the sacrifice. There's the cell wall or cell membrane and so on. Now we get to Solomon's temple. After they come into the promised land, they first start out in Shiloh. But God destroys Shiloh because of the wickedness of the people. It's in David's heart. To build God a permanent dwelling place in Jerusalem. But God won't let David do it. So he lets Solomon do it. Solomon builds a house unto God. And the two most prominent pieces of this house. Were the two pillars that stood in the front. In the entrance to this uh, temple. And in 1 Kings. He cast the two pillars of brass. Of 18 cubits high apiece. And a line of 12 cubits did compass either one of them. In other words, that's how big around they were. And he made two chapters or caps, capitals of molten brass to set upon the tops of the pillars. The height of the one chapter was five cubits and the height of the other chapter was five cubits. So if you have 18 cubits plus five cubits, you have 23 cubits total and there's two of them. So that makes another 46 again and this is where the book of the law that Moses wrote was stored in this grand wonderful beautiful building it was stored there again you have the number 46 
before anybody. This goes back 3,000 years when Solomon built this. 3,000 years ago, God put that number on that temple to show us at a time when we would find it out just how miraculous God really is. And just how amazing this book really is. But that temple got destroyed too. So after they came back from Babylonian captivity, they built the other one. They called it Herod's Temple because after they built it during the 400 years between Malachi and Matthew, it fell into disarray. Herod went in and sort of remodeled the place. So they referred to it as, as Herod's Temple, even though Herod didn't build it. But what did they say when Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will build it again? They said 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. And wilt thou rear it up in three days? But they wist not that he was talking about the temple of his body. So imagine that it took him exactly 46 years to build this temple. Solomon's temple had two pillars 46 cubits tall, both of them together. Moses' tabernacle had 46 boards that held it together. All of them a absolute perfect picture of God's dwelling place. And what it is, it's a picture of the real temple of God that isn't made with hands. See, all of this, that's what it's showing you. Number one, it's showing you that God... Knew what he was doing. God knew how many chromosomes we had before we even knew what chromosomes were. Nobody knew the process of what exactly happened when a man and a woman conceived a child. Nobody knew that until late 1800s, early 1900s. Using microscopes, we figure all of that out. Now we're able to see it happen. But nobody knew how that was done, but God did. God knew all the mysteries because he's the one that created it. He's the creator God. But what he's showing us is all of these buildings with that number 46 attached to it. He's telling us these are represent temples that are not made with hands. Those are the ones that I'm going to dwell in. So in the 46th book of the Bible. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Verse 17 If any man defile the temple of God him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy which temple ye are. And, and, and again, remember how do you defile the temple of God? By what you put in by what comes out. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be derogatory or I'm not going to try to, uh, say anything against the man that brought this up to me. He was asking a legitimate question, although he didn't, he didn't really like my answer. But he asked me the question and we had, and we had a nice conversation. There was no argument. I told him what I thought. He told me what he thought. I don't agree with him. But he asked me the question. He said, when a person drinks alcohol, do they drink when the alcohol goes in? Does it put a devil in them? And I said, I don't see any scripture that indicates that. And he said, well, Mike, it's called spirits. I said, I, I understand that, but. I think that has more to do with the fermentation process and then the distillation process. Because if you take mash, if you're going to make corn liquor, you take the corn mash, you let it ferment, and then you run that through a distillery and the spirits of that mash is coming out. Now you have the alcohol without all the corn goo in it. And what he was eventually getting at was he wanted to be able to prove that if someone took a COVID vaccine, that they were injecting spirits in people, devils in people. And I said, 
look, I understand you, you don't trust this vaccine. I don't trust this vaccine. But I'm not going to sit here and tell you without any scripture backing whatsoever that I think people can eat something and ingest something and that puts devils in them. I think there's other ways that happens. Okay, so I just, we just, we disagreed. I have something to put towards that. Um, now I'm talking, maybe you can turn into a devil. Well, that, I, and that's what I told him. I said, once you're drunk, you have, you have turned your mind, you've opened up a doorway in your mind that is supposed to be closed where devils can gain entrance into parts of your mind that they normally would not have access to because you've made yourself drunk and they make you do stupid stuff. Yeah. Okay, so you're right on that. And that's what I said to him. I said, but if you're trying to get me to say that somebody can give you a shot and then you're now devil possessed because you took a shot, I, that, I do not see that in the Bible anywhere. I do not believe that's scriptural. Okay, so anyway, but we are def we defile the temple not by what goes in the temple, but by what comes out of that temple. First Corinthians six nineteen. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. So the temple of God is what Jesus is going to inhabit. Now turn to Hebrews chapter eight. And this is this is what I like this. This stuff right here, Hebrews 8, I love this passage because to me, it explains to us, is there going to be a last day's temple? Yes. Who's going to build it? Is it going to be the Jews? No. Is it going to be the New World Order? No. Is it going to be the Rockefellers? No. Is it going to be the Clintons, the Bushes? Is it going to be the Satan worshipers? No. It's going to be Jesus himself. Hebrews 8, chap chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So I believe that when Jesus comes to establish his kingdom, the house that he's going to dwell in is the one that he himself created. He himself makes it. He himself built it. He is the master builder and not man. He is not going to dwell in any building, temple, shed, mansion, or otherwise that man built himself. He is going to pitch his own tabernacle, the Bible says. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship. I did not make myself into whatever I am now. I did not do that. God did that in me. To me, with me, he is the potter and I am just the clay. And does the clay tell the potter what to do? No, the clay just sits there. The potter is the one who determines what creation, what workmanship he's going to put into it. We don't do that. But I guarantee you, once you find out that you are a vessel fit for the master's use, you'll be happy. Amen. Amen. I don't care what it is, you'll be happy. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. First Peter 2. Turn there, First Peter 2. Beautiful passage. I've been, uh, for the last few days in preparation for the next Watchman, which will probably not be this weekend. Um, I've been reading the Catholic Catechism. 
And I just sit and shake my head at what I read in there. They use a lot of what I would call anecdotal proof of why they believe what they believe. What I mean by that is, okay, so they're, one of their doctrines is that you pray to Mary to get Jesus to hear your prayers, which is in no verse anywhere in the Bible. So since they don't have it in a verse anywhere in the Bible, they use anecdotal evidence. They say, well, in life, does not a son pay honor to his mother? Would not a son be willing to do what his mother has asked him to do? They use that kind of evidence, which is not authority. But to them, that's all they have is illustrations from how things are done in the world, but not from the word of God. So I don't know what I must have read something about first Peter chapter two, lively stones. I must have read something in there. That's what made me think of it. I've been reading the catechism for the last few days and I'm, my mind is just I just can't believe some of the things I read in there. First Peter chapter two, ye also as lively stones. Now here's where I want you to think something. I want you to think that your Bible means what it says. Just as my body is made up of little bitty stones called cells. It's like a, like a brick house. The whole house is made up of individual pieces. One brick at a time. And those bricks in my body are represented by the cells that make my body. Okay? So we are the stones that build up a spiritual house. So when Jesus comes back and he's going to make his house that he's going to dwell in, I absolutely believe, and I'm convinced of it, that he's going to make it out of the believers in Jesus Christ. That we literally, in every sense of it, are to, to be the stones that make up the house that Jesus lives in for a thousand years. And when I say that no man's eyes has ever seen such a building. I mean it. The Taj Mahal will be nothing compared to the house that Jesus builds. Because he is going to use us as the stones that make up that house. What did he say? I don't know if I have this in my note. Yeah, I do. Revelation 3.12. Him that overcometh will I make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Now, a lot of people look at that and say, well, that's a, a spiritual pillar. And I would say, yes. But according to what I see in the Bible, spirits are actually more real than us. We're just the shadows. Of spiritual things, heavenly things. So if he says, him that overcometh, will I make him a pillar in the temple of my God? I literally believe that we will be pillars of the house of God that he dwells in. Does he not already dwell in us now? And where did this body come from? Did man make it? No, God made it. God made Adam, God made Eve, so he made the rest of us. Okay, so you just take that and think about it for a while. Because I've already had people make the videos that said I'm an idiot for even bringing up such a thing. So I'm used to that one. Okay, but imagine 
a temple that Jesus makes that is composed, the building materials themselves is composed of the believers in Jesus Christ who have come back with him to reign a thousand years. Some of us get to be pillars, some of us get to be bricks, some of us, well, we know the apostles are the foundations. Maybe I get to be a hanging chandelier. <laughs> Who cares? Amen. As long as I'm in there somewhere. Jesus abides in me. Amen. Yeah. 